introduction. Neil, a special thank you to you for making me a part of the Ottawa Writers Festival, particularly in its 20th anniversary year. Uh, I've been a diplomat now for 32 years. I've been writer only for the last 10 odd. And this is the first city I'm serving in which has its own Writers Festival. So to, uh, to be a part of that is really something very, very special. <laughs> Generally, I have to travel long distances, thousands of miles to go to a literary festival. This time, I just had to travel from Rockcliffe. <laughs> <laughs> so, Peter suggested that I begin with a bit of a reading. So, I'm going to read first from Slumdog Millionaire, or rather Q&A as I prefer to call it. Uh, this is a chapter, uh, for those of you who have seen the movie, and I'm sure probably Pretty much everyone here would have seen the movie and one-fourth of you or maybe one-tenth of you would have read the book. So in the movie, the character is called Jamal Malik. Uh, he's a Muslim uh, and he, he is part of a family. He has a, a brother called Salim. But in the book, the lead character is an orphan. He does not have any brothers. Uh, he's a complete orphan. And this is the story of how that lead character got that name. And that name is a very unique one. It's Ram Muhammad Thomas. So Ram, as you know, comes from the Hindu religion, Muhammad from the Islamic religion, Thomas from the Christian religion. This is the story of how he got that name. So Ram Muhammad Thomas was basically dumped by his mother outside St. Mary's church. And, uh, you know, he lived in that church till he got adopted. So this is the story of how he got the name. The sisters of St. Mary ran an orphanage and an, and an adoption agency, and I was put out for adoption together with a clutch of other orphan babies. All the other babies were collected, but no one came for me. A prospective mother and father would see me and exchange glances with each other. There would be an imperceptible shake of the head, and then they would move on to the next cradle. I do not know why. Perhaps I was too dark, too ugly, too colicky, Perhaps I didn't have a cherubic smile, or I gurgled too much. So I remained at the orphanage for two years. Oddly enough, the sisters never got around to giving me a name. I was just called Baby, the baby that no one wanted. I was finally adopted by Mrs. Philomena Thomas and her husband Dominic Thomas. Originally from Nagarkoil in Tamil Nadu, they now lived in Delhi. Mrs. Thomas worked as a cleaner in St. Joseph's Church and her husband as the gardener. Because they were in their 40s without any children of their own, Father Timothy Francis, the parish priest, had been urging them to consider adopting to fill the void in their life. He even directed them to St. Mary's Orphanage. Mr. Thomas must have taken one look at me and immediately passed on to the next baby. But Mrs. Philomena Thomas selected me the moment she saw me. I was a perfect match for her dark skin. The Thomases spent two months completing the paperwork for my adoption. But within three days of taking me home, and even before I could be christened, Mr. Thomas discovered that the void in his wife's life had already been filled. Not by me, but by a Muslim gentleman by the name of Mastan Sheikh, who was the local ladies' tailor, specializing in short skirts. <laughs> Mrs. Philomena Thomas ditched her old husband and newly adopted baby and ran off with the tailor, reportedly to Bhopal. Her whereabouts are not known to this day. On discovering this, Mr. Thomas went into a rage. He dragged me in my cradle to the, to the priest's house and dumped me there. Father, this baby is the root cause of all the trouble in my life. You forced me to adopt him, so now you decide what to do with him. And before Father Timothy could even say Amen, Dominic Thomas walked out of the church. He was last seen buying a train ticket for Bhopal with a shotgun in his hands. So willy-nilly, I became Father Timothy's responsibility. He gave me food. He gave me shelter, and he gave me a name, Joseph Michael Thomas. There was no baptism ceremony. No priest dipped my head into a font. No holy water was sprinkled. No white shawl was draped over me. No candle was lit. But I became Joseph Michael Thomas for six days. On the seventh day, two men came to meet Father Timothy, a fat man wearing a white kurta pajama and a thin, bearded man wearing a sherwani. We are from the All Faith Committee, the fat man said. I am Mr. Jagdish Sharma. This is Mr. Inayat Hidayatullah. Our third board member, Mr. Harvinder Singh, representing the Sikh faith, was also to come, but he is unfortunately held up at the Gurdwara. We will come straight to the point. We are told, Father, that you have given shelter to a little orphan boy. Yes, the poor boy's adoptive parents have disappeared, leaving him in my care, said Father Timothy, 
still unable to figure out the reason for this unexpected visit. What name have you given this boy? Joseph Michael Thomas. Isn't that a Christian name? Yes, but how do you know he was born to Christian parents? Well, I don't. Then why have you given him a Christian name? Well, I had to call him something. What's wrong with Joseph Michael Thomas? Everything. Don't you know, Father, how strong the movement is against conversion in these parts? Several churches have been set fire to by irate mobs who were led to believe that mass, Christian, mass conversions to Christianity were taking place there. But this is no conversion. Look, Father, we know you did not have any ulterior motive, but word has got around that you have converted a Hindu boy. But how do you know he's Hindu? It won't matter to the Lumpen elements who are planning to ransack your church tomorrow. That is why we have come to help you, to cool things down. What do you suggest I do? I suggest you change the boy's name. To what? Well, giving him a Hindu name might do the trick. Why not name him Ram, after one of our favorite gods, said Mr. Sharma. Mr. Hidayatullah coughed gently. <clears throat> Excuse me, Mr. Sharma, but aren't we replacing one evil with another? I mean, what is the proof that the boy was a Hindu at birth? He might have been Muslim, you know. Why can't he be called Muhammad? Mr. Sharma and Mr. Hidayatullah debated the respective merits of Ram and Muhammad for the next 30 minutes. Finally, Father Timothy gave up. Look, if it takes a name change to get the mob off my back, I'll do it. How about if I accept both your suggestions and change the boy's name to Ram Muhammad Thomas? That should satisfy everyone. Luckily for me, that Mr. Singh did not come that day. So in our introduction, we established that before you became a well-known writer with Q&A in 2005, you were well-established as a diplomat. I'd like to ask you about your own coming of age and how you felt the calling to enter the public service as a diplomat. Yeah. Look, I was born in a very uh, small city in India called Allahabad. And, uh, you know, one of the advantages of being born uh, in the pre-internet, pre-cable TV era was the only pastime I had was reading books. My grandfather was a well-known lawyer. He had 10,000 books in his library, and he was a very eclectic reader himself. So nestling next to a copy of Mein Kampf, Hitler's autobiography, would be Isaiah Berlin's essay on uh, liberty. Uh, so there were all kinds of books, and because I had nothing else to do, I read all those books. And reading, and I was particularly fascinated by fiction, you know, uh, reading Agatha Christie, Alistair MacLean, uh, Franz Kafka, uh, Albert, uh, Albert Camus. I, I read anyone and everyone that, uh, that I could lay my hands on. And that really, sitting in Allahabad, you know, reading about Omofia or Gabriel Garcia Marquez's imaginary town of Macondo or Franz Kafka's Vienna or Albert Camus' Algeria, it created that fascination in me to actually go to these places. I read about, you know, children reading, eating scones, but I had never eaten a scone in my life. So I think it was that initial engagement with the world of books that created in me, in me the fascination to really go abroad and see those places that I had read about in the books. And then, of course, I was also motivated by my interest in international relations, and I thought the Foreign Service would be the perfect career for that. And believe me, I think I made the wisest choice. I still believe that the Indian Foreign Service is the best service in the government of India. 20 years into your career as a diplomat, you're posted to London. And it's in London where you begin to write. My question to you is, was it London as a literary epicenter, or was it the time in your life that allowed you to write? Yeah. I think there were two or three things. Uh, one, of course, the fact that I was in London, the hub of the world of English language publishing. If you have to publish, better publish in London, because all the publishers are there, all the agents are there. And every week, I would hear of some new author being born, some new book being launched. Secondly, the second inspiration was some of my contemporaries in the Foreign Service had started writing fiction. And when I read about their books, I mean, to me, it felt amazing. I had never imagined these people could be writers, but they are trying their hand at fiction. In fact, there are so many Foreign Service officers who have written books now that people have started talking about an IFS school of writing. <laughs> uh, Humphrey Hoxley, the BBC journalist, uh, told me, he says, I have yet to meet a Foreign Service officer who is not in search of a publisher. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, Actually, they acted as a huge inspiration to me. Uh, our current ambassador to the United States, Navteet Sarna, is one of those authors. His book had just come out. It's called We Weren't Lovers Like That. And when I read about it, uh, and I read that book, uh, I said, do I also have a story inside me? Can I also write? And the third thing that happened was that my wife and my two sons, and my wife, Aparna, is here, and one of my sons, Varun, is here. Uh, they uh, had already gone back to India. 
uh, because the school, I was posted back to Delhi. Uh, so the school session in India begins in March, April. So that's why they went back early. And I was all alone. So I wrote this book, my first book, Q&A, literally in the last two months of my posting in London. Wow. And what has been published is my first draft. And it came together that quickly. It, yeah, I, I suppose uh, that's the advantage a first-time author can have. Uh, and do you know, I think that continues through all of your books. They move quickly. They are filled with incident and plot and story. And they move with great thoughtfulness, but also with the momentum of a thriller. Yeah, there's a reason for that. Uh, when I first decided that I'll be a writer, you know, as I said, having been inspired by the city of London and by my fellow, uh, my contemporaries in the foreign service, I said, okay, I'll be a writer, but then what should I write? And growing up, I was fascinated by the thriller genre, but I was very strategic about it. I said, let's first find out who are the great Indian thriller writers. So I went to the Hampstead Library. I was living in London at that time, and I tried to look for Indian thriller writers, and I could not discover even one. <laughs> So that told me, I said, Indians are not good thriller writers. They, they fail at, uh, at, uh, at writing thrillers. So I said, now let me discover what do they write. Because till then, all my reading had been about Western authors. I had not really read Indian authors writing in English. I had read Indian authors writing in Hindi, but I had not read Indian authors writing in English. So I said, let's first find out what do Indian writers excel at. So I read Vikram Seth, and I read Arundhati Roy, and I read Pankaj Mishra, and I read Man Suri, and I read B.S. Naipaul. And you know, you name it, about 35, 40, 50 writers I read. And I discovered two things. One, not one of them has written a thriller. And two, all of them have written about society. But I couldn't get over my fascination with thrillers. So I said, let me create my own genre. I will write about society, but in a thrilling kind of a way. And I call my books social thrillers. Absolutely. <laughs>